So my brief was uh, give a brief overview on how to manage thyroid disease from an endocrinologist perspective. Um, and sort of in further email, Julia said, maybe tell a bit about how the thyroid works. I apologize if you know all this, uh, I'll go over it relatively quickly. Um, I'll talk about the guidance on goiter and nodules, uh, and then I'll just put out a few of what I think is new uh, and the highlights in the guidelines, trying not to sort of broach on what other people are going to tell you in order to not make this too repetitive. So um, I think you, you all know this, but so your thyroid gland is in your neck. Um, it's a brownish red gland. Uh, that generally uh, a normal gland weighs about 25 to 30 grams. Um, so it's surrounded by a thin capsule of connective tissue and it has a right and a left lobe. So the bit in the middle, which I'll try and uh, locate, the uh, pointer doesn't work, the bit in the middle is the isthmus uh, that connects the two lobes. Um, so what's shown at the bottom there is when we take a section through a thyroid gland, that, that's what it looks like. So the thyroid gland is essentially made up of these follicles um, and it is uh, the cartoon there uh, shows what's, what's the real uh, pathology picture at the bottom. And so essentially you have these follicles that are lined by these follicular cells and they are the cells that produce thyroid hormones. Um, and thyroid hormones, as we all know, are very important. They control our metabolism, so they help in the uh, balance between an energy generation and use. They're crucially important to growth um, and to development. And we know that if there is thyroid hormone deficiency in utero, then that results in uh, things such as uh, at the bottom there, uh, that poor baby with cretinism. Um. So the two thyroid hormones that I think we're all uh, most interested in um, are thyroxine and thyroidothyronine. And the difference between the two is that thyroxine or T4 has four iodine residues and uh, T3 has three iodine residues, and so the chemical formula is given there, and you can see four iodine residues, the I at the bottom and three at the top. And so our thyroid gland, so people with an intact thyroid gland, the thyroid gland will produce mainly T4, um, even though T3 is the active thyroid hormone. And so what we have in our peripheral tissues are enzymes that will activate the inactive T4 to T3. About 20% of the T3 that we have is directly produced by the thyroid gland. So you have different, type of the, different types of these deiodinase enzymes, some are activating, some are inactivating, but essentially the way you get from T4 to T3 is by taking one of these iodine residues away uh, and making T3. And thyroid hormones circulate in the blood bound to proteins. Um, so the main protein to which they're bound is thyroxine binding globulin or TBG. Um, and then to a lesser extent, there are other proteins uh, to which there is more sort of non-specific binding. And if you compare the amount of free thyroid hormone compared to the total amount of hormone, this is actually very, very little. You can see the percentages at the bottom there. Um, so the amount of free hormone in our blood, they're actually very minuscule uh, amounts. Um, I won't, uh, tr I try not to tread on uh, David's toes, don't always succeed in that. But essentially, uh, the tests that we request in our laboratory, there'll be three tests. So there's a serum TSH, serum 3T3 and serum 3T4. And in hyperthyroidism, what happens is that you have increased levels of uh, T4 and T3 and reduced levels of TSH. And in hypothyroidism, there will be reduced levels of T4 and T3 uh, with an increased uh, serum TSH. So this is when we talk about primary disease and the NICE guidelines very much did focus on primary thyroid disease. So not disease that originates in the pituitary gland or that originates as a consequence of medication. And so uh, thyroid diseases are common. Uh, the prevalences are given there. So hyperthyroidism affects probably about 3% of women in the UK. So the incidence rate is the number of uh, new people that are diagnosed with this uh, each year. Um, so both hyper and hypothyroidism are generally caused by autoimmune conditions and are 10 times more common in women than in men. Goiter is even more prevalent. So goiter just means is a non-specific term for an enlarged thyroid gland. Um, and so about 25% of people um, will have a goiter. If you look at nodules, that's even more prevalent. Probably about 50% of people have a thyroid nodule. And again, incidence rates are given there. So moving on then to the NICE guidelines, and the reason why I sort of give this introduction here is, uh, as Sarah has already said, what was really important to us was 
that uh, in order to manage patients with thyroid disease, which generally are chronic conditions, it's really important that patients are informed. So the first section of the guidelines is actually information to patients, carers and families. Um, and I think, you know, I always try and emphasize that in my clinics, to my medical students, it's really important that a patient understands what you're talking about here, because it makes the management of the disease so much easier. Um, so what we wanted to get across is that for most patients, thyroid disease actually responds well to treatment. Um, and the goal of our treatment is that we want to get rid of patient's symptoms, but also try and align the thyroid function test to within the normal range or at least as close to as possible. There is generally not a very good correlation between a patient's symptoms and the tests. And you, that is something, and so lots of patients will come to us, and I'm sure this will come up uh, throughout the day here, that patients say, well, I go to my doctor, they say your test is normal, you should be feeling well. Um, and generally that correlation is poor, um, so we acknowledge that. Uh, we provide information, I think it's important that we provide information to patients on the condition, treatment, the risks of treatment and when to seek advice and the BTF actually have brilliant uh, information leaflets for patients so I regularly use those uh, in my clinic. There are various other uh, sources where you can get uh, information but I think that's really important. And then there are sections on each of the various conditions uh, that, that we uh, encompassed in the guideline. So that was a sort of a general introduction from, I think, where I sit as an endocrinologist, where I think it's really important that we inform people the main conditions that we see. So essentially, you can break that down in three large groups. So there's hyperthyroidism, most of which is managed in secondary and tertiary care. There is hypothyroidism, which is largely managed in primary care. And the people that come to my clinic tend to be the people who don't feel well. Uh, who have problems with uh, thyroid replacement. And then again, thyroid enlargement generally will be picked up in primary care, such as hyperthyroidism is as well, but will then generally be managed in secondary and uh, tertiary care. So thyroid enlargement can take many forms and can be identified in many different ways. So you can see at the top there, um, so someone with a sort of more localised, you can see two thyroid nodules there that are visible. Um, or some people indeed have a very big uh, goiter. Increasingly now, we find thyroid nodules and thyroid enlargement incidentally. So this is found when a patient has an investigation, an imaging investigation for a non-thyroid related reason, but such as on, the on that scan there, the ultrasound scan, what those arrows indicate is the presence of a thyroid nodule on an ultrasound scan. And then again, uh, the one on the right there, so that's a PET scan. So that's a scan that a patient who has a cancer, not thyroid cancer, who has a cancer somewhere, undergoes a scan to see if there's any disease in anywhere. And what you have is one of these thyroid nodules light up in that PET scan. Uh, and increasingly, because people undergo more tests, because more people survive cancers, have surveillance for cancer, we find more and more nodules. So a thyroid nodule is defined as something that's a discrete lesion within the thyroid gland which is radiologically distinct from the rest of the thyroid gland. As I've already said, sometimes we see this, we can feel it in about 8% of people. We can see it on imaging or you can find it incidentally. Again, this is more common in women and it's more common in older people. So the ratio of uh, females to males is 4 to 1. <coughs> And in areas where there's low iodine intake, there is an increased risk of getting goitus, thyroid enlargement and thyroid nodules. So does it matter that you have a thyroid nodule? Well, there are three questions, and that's what I always tell patients. There are three questions that we ask, because um, enlarged thyroid gland, and we'll be talking about hypo and hyperthyroidism uh, later on, uh, and I, I won't be talking too much about this now, but an enlarged thyroid gland can be a sign that there is something wrong there, that there is abnormal thyroid function. So you need to establish whether there is abnormal thyroid function present because that can result in thyroid enlargement or can be resulting from a thyroid nodule and that requires different management to a thyroid nodule that's associated with normal thyroid function. A goiter such as one that I showed there can be very big and can actually cause compression on the trachea and the windpipe. But the main reason we worry about thyroid nodules after we've uh, determined that the thyroid function is normal is that we need to exclude thyroid cancer. 
And I've just told you that about 50, possibly more, 50% of people have a thyroid nodule. So if, you, if I brought an ultrasound scan in here and scanned all your necks, I'll find a number of thyroid nodules. But the prevalence of malignancy is actually very low, is about 5%. So it's therefore important to identify those patients who need further management. And generally it's considered that this is independent of the size. So it's not because it's a bigger nodule that it's more likely to be malignant or a bigger goiter. Um, there's no reason to think why a nodule, so an incidentaloma is those that you find on a scan that you didn't do to look for the thyroid gland, but that you found incidentally. Um, there's no reason to think why that couldn't also be malignant. And we know the one that, you, that I showed you that lights up on a PET scan, we actually worry about that one because that's probably got about a 30% risk of being malignant. And because we're finding these nodules much more commonly, what we now have entered is an era where, we have, uh, where we're diagnosing a lot of very low-risk thyroid cancer. So we have this explosion of thyroid cancers over the last 30 years. So these are data from CRUK. Um, pink for women, blue for men, very politically incorrect. Not my choice. I downloaded it. It's from CRUK. Uh, but you can see that for both men and women, this is going up uh, quite significantly. Um, but it still only represents less than 1% of all cancers. The incidence, current incidence in the UK is about 3.2 per 100,000. Um, and again, um, it's uh, increased in females uh, in certain countries. It's more, uh, the, the ratio of um, men to women is higher. Uh, and in 2013, there were 3,241 new cases, but actually a relative low number of deaths from thyroid cancer. So this is what a thyroid ultrasound uh, would look like. I'm not sure how well this projects. I'm not a radiologist. But essentially what you look at here is a nodule that looks a little bit suspicious because it's lighter than the rest of the thyroid gland. It's got those, I can't point it out, but it's got a few calcifications in. And then what's on the right there is when we look at the blood flow through that nodule and that's increased. So um, this, is, this, is, this is one of the reasons why we would worry about this nodule. So generally when we have a patient approach us with a thyroid nodule, uh, we take a history and there are certain things in a patient's history that can make us worry a little bit about whether that nodule may be malignant. If there is a family history, especially if this is a family history of medullary thyroid cancer, which is a specific type of thyroid cancer. If this person has had radiation to the neck, so we now increasingly see people who've survived childhood cancers, leukemias, lymphomas, who've had neck irradiation, so they're at increased risk of getting thyroid nodules, and we worry about those because they may be malignant. Um, just having a history of Hodgkin's disease or a lymphoma per se increases the risk. And then nodules in very old people or in very young people are those that we worry about more. And generally, it's, like I said, less common in men, but a nodule in a, men, in a man I worry about more than a nodule in a woman. So generally, uh, and this is common practice now, should be common practice across the UK, is that uh, once we have taken the history, we then proceed with an ultrasound. Now, sometimes people have already come to us because they've had an ultrasound, but if they haven't, if there is a palpable nodule or a visible nodule there, then that needs to be evaluated with an ultrasound. And we know that this is uh, very sensitive to diagnose thyroid nodules, and sometimes the radiologist can actually do the ultrasound scan and say, this is a thyroid cancer, without taking a biopsy from it, because it's got all those criteria that makes them say, so they'll be ringing me up, they'll say, Christine, this is one that you know, will need to come out, this, is, uh, this looks like a cancer. The ultrasound also helps us identify those nodules that we want to take a biopsy from. So FNA stands for fine needle aspiration biopsy, so that's taking some cells out from it. And it's not necessarily the nodule that we feel or see, that's the one we worry about. So again, they might ring me up and say, the one you feel looks fine. There is actually another nodule there that we worry about. It helps us to put the needle in the right place to take uh, cells out from the bit of the nodule that we worry about. Um, and ideally this is done. So again, uh, lots of guidance, um, not, not within NICE, but lots of guidance in the UK is about having experienced people deal with this. So there should be an experienced radiographer doing it. I won't bore you with all the ultrasound features, but like the one I showed you, the ones that are lighter than the rest of the uh, thyroid gland, uh, the ones that are irregular in margin, the ones that have microcalcifications, the ones that have increased vascularity, 
those are the ones that we worry about. And generally, what, and so there are a number of scoring systems that are used uh, across the world. This is the one that's most commonly used in the UK. It's what we call the U classification, U for ultrasound. Um, but so this takes a combination of all these various ultrasound criteria. It combines them. And if you look at all the other systems, so there is in America there is an ATA system. There is something called the Parrot system that is very, com uh, very commonly used in Europe. They're actually much of a muchness. And for NICE, we compared the different scoring systems. And there isn't actually much to choose. What NICE recommends is that you use a scoring system in order to classify nodules. So this is the one that I'm most familiar with because that's what's mostly used in the UK. That's, what was, uh, in, that's what's in the BTA guidance. And essentially, as you go from U1 to U5, U1, that's an entirely normal thyroid. U2, those are benign changes. And U5, that's the one where the radiologist might ring me up and say, this is definitely a cancer. Um, and you can see that it's a combination of these various factors that are taken into account. And then just for those of you who uh, may have had nodules or thyroid cancer, uh, the other thing to highlight is that we then, once we take cells out, once a nodule looks, so those nodules that go from three to five, three means we don't actually really know, but it could be a cancer. What we then do is we stick a needle in it and take some cells out. We then use this thigh classification, which again goes from one to five, with an increasing risk of there being malignancy present going from one to five. So thigh one means you haven't actually aspirated enough cells. So that means you need to repeat the aspirate because it's not, you can't say you don't have cancer, I haven't actually aspirated the cells, so I don't really know, so you need to repeat that. Two is normal. And then from three onwards, the risk of there being malignancy present increases and that determines what we subsequently do with it. So the NICE guidelines very much, uh, because we couldn't encompass thyroid cancer as well, they very much stopped at the diagnosis of a thyroid cancer making. Um, so, uh, so diagnosis making of thyroid cancer. There is currently uh, under development a NICE thyroid gui guideline for thyroid cancer. So that takes up from where we left up off here. So what we say um, in the NICE guidelines that we, when you investigate thyroid enlargement with normal thyroid function, so that's really important. So you've established that the function is normal. This is not hypo or hyperthyroidism because that requires different management. Um, so you do an ultrasound in a palpable uh, thyroid enlargement or a nodule if you suspect malignancy. And generally you would suspect malignancy um, if that is uh, visible uh, or palpable. Um, those that you find, incident, find incidentally, again, uh, you need to do an ultrasound scan. So if this is picked up on a CT scan, an MRI scan, a PET scan, you do need to do an ultrasound scan. And then you use a grading system to take all these various factors into account, such as the one that I illustrated with the U classification. It doesn't say use the U classification, but use a scoring system. It's really important because so I get this fairly often that a patient has been seen by a GP, they get sent somewhere in a community to have an ultrasound and the report comes to me and it says, this has got a 2.1 centimeter left-sided nodule. That doesn't mean anything to me. That's a complete, completely useless report. So we do specify, and the BTA guidelines do also specify, that this should have information on what that nodule look, looks like. Um, and provide an overall assessment of malignancy. So come to a score that gives you an indication, could or could this not be malignant, uh, and specify which grading system has been used. And then if you take an aspirate from it, this should be done on the ultrasound, is again what NICE uh, recommend. So when I was young, a long time ago, um, and started training, um, if there was a visible nodule, we would just stick a needle in that blindly and aspirate some cells. So I think the evidence is now accumulated that this really should be done under ultrasound guidance because it helps us. So some nodules have a mixed features, cystic and solid. You want to go into that solid component. So it's best on, uh, under ultrasound guidance. If you determine that this is a benign nodule, then generally that patient can be discharged. So like I said, 50% of us have a thyroid nodule. I can't keep 50% of the population in my clinics. That is not possible. So if you determine that it's benign, discharge the patient. Um, 
unless that nodule or that thyroid enlargement is associated with breathing difficulty or there is clinical concern such as airway narrowing. And so generally you would not do anything again for this patient unless there are new symptoms that develop or symptoms worsen or if you think hmm, this nodule is actually growing quite quickly so the patient comes back and says it, it was barely there or I could barely feel it but now you know it's, it's really enlarging quite rapidly that is something that then needs further evaluation and that's what the guidelines uh, recommend. If you have a thyroid cyst and some of these can be big um, then often what we can do is aspirate the fluid from it. Um, for some patients that's it. The cyst is then aspirated, they're fine, hunky-dory, uh, never have to come back again. Often the cyst fluid reaccumulates and what you can, then can do is uh, put a bit of ethanol uh, or alcohol in that. Um, if this is a non-cystic nodule, but, so you've determined that this is not malignant, um, you would do, and you have to manage this, then the best treatment of a thyroid nodule always, and even, uh, yeah, so a, a non-cystic thyroid nodule, the best treatment is always with surgery, um, especially if there's area narrowing. Radioactive iodine can help, um, and certainly in patients with large goiters, especially if there's sort of elderly patients who may have a uh, weak heart, lots of other comorbidities where the surgeon's like, mm, I'm not actually really sure whether I should operate on this, then radioactive iodine may help in shrinking uh, the thyroid gland, and that's what we recommend. And then there are a number of newer uh, treatments on the horizon, percutaneous thermal ablation, radiofrequency ablation. These are not commonplace in the UK yet, but we do acknowledge in the guidelines that they are there. And then so the final bit of my brief was that I should highlight uh, what I think is uh, new. Um, so, like I said, there's a big emphasis in the NICE guidelines on providing information to patients. Uh, we do give specific, so we looked at which, who are the patients who should routinely be tested for thyroid dysfunction. So, um, type two, in type 1 diabetes, um, we definitely recommend that uh, patients have uh, thyroid function testing. But in those with type 2 diabetes, we don't routinely recommend this. Uh, David will enlighten us, on, enlighten us on the cascading system of testing, but again, I, th this is relatively new and will hopefully standardise the way in which we approach thyroid function testing in the UK. Generally, if you've measured TPO antibodies, and that is to determine uh, if there is autoimmune thyroid disease there, um, if you've measured that once, then generally that does not repeat, need repeat testing unless there are very specific conditions. I'll come back about uh, overt hypothyroidism and hypothyroidism treatment this afternoon. But so the overriding message from the guideline is that this should be treated with levothyroxine therapy. I will discuss it later. Um, I think someone's going to talk about subclinical hypothyroidism, but we generally recommend uh, treating in those under 65 uh, who have, uh, and definitely in everyone, when the TSH is over 10. Um, if the TSH is high, but below 10, and that patient is under 65, we recommend that a uh, six-month trial of treatment is given. And it's going to talk to us about hyperthyroidism, but there it's really important that we define what the reason is why this patient has hyperthyroidism. And what's new is that we recommend radioiodine as first-line treatment for Graves' disease. That was already the case for toxic nodular hyperthyroidism in most uh, centres, uh, but for most patients with Graves' disease, uh, we recommend this. Subclinical hyper, um, so we say consider treatment if TSH is less, repeatedly less than 0.1, that's usually managed and decided in secondary care. I've talked about the need to do ultrasound and biopsy for thyroid enlargement, and the final point is to emphasize that, and this, is, this may need to em emphasize to clinicians, if you've decided this is benign um, and isn't causing any thyroid dysfunction, discharge the patient and stop doing umpteen tests uh, that, that will not uh, inform us any further. Thank you very much.